Good morning. First of all, uh, I would like to thank the organizer for the invitation and uh, for giving me the opportunity to share uh, some of our uh, thoughts about uh, Beyond 5G or 6G mobile network. Uh, actually, some of you may be surprised that uh, uh, you know uh, we are already uh, talking about 6G while we are still uh, at the very early stage of 5G deployment and uh, in few um, uh, cities uh, worldwide. But I hope that uh, I will convince you by uh, the end of today's talk that uh, actually uh, we need to start talking about what should 6G be. So uh, let us start by talking about the so-called uh, mobile uh, revolution. Uh, indeed, uh, some argue that uh, mobile is the most uh, rapidly adopted consumer uh, technology in history. Uh, this is uh, in one way uh, the result of the merger of the internet, uh, electronics, uh, wireless communication, networking. Uh, so, you know, as you know, today we can use our mobile or tablets uh, to make phone and video calls, order things online, check accurately uh, location, and of course our time, uh, access all sorts of uh, entertainment like listening to music, watching a movie, and as you know, many more things. So it's kind of mind-boggling that uh, what was regarded as independent services and dependent function, uh, I would say even, you know, kind of really different tools, uh, different device just a few years ago, have been combined and integrated over the last decade or so in a single mobile smartphone. Uh, but uh, we still want more, uh, more coverage and more connectivity, uh, higher data rates, better access anytime and anywhere. And all of this, uh, of course, in a cheaper, or let us say, in a more affordable fashion. Uh, so, uh, you know, Actually, these increasing demands are, are something that we have seen over and over again during the past four decades. So 1G was in a way the proof of concept stage and it brought us in the 80s uh, the first mobile phones. During the 90s, uh, 2G made us move from analog communication to better quality, high fidelity digital communication with both uh, voice and uh, let's say uh, texting and emailing exchange capabilities. Then came the 3G era in the 2000s, and with it we moved online and start uh, browsing the internet from our uh, uh, mobile phones. And uh, we are in a way now at the end uh, of the 4G era, enjoying high speed provided by our smartphone. Uh, a speed that is expected to go to even higher values and to connect uh, a higher number of uh, uh, IoT device and uh, machine and sensors with the early deployment of 5G this year. Essentially, as we speak, this is happening in many cities worldwide. So as you can notice from the slide in front of you, it takes about 10 years to design, develop, uh, validate the generation of mobile communication system, and it takes another 10 years to deploy it expand its usage until it becomes mature, in a way obsolete, and it gets eventually tired so that the following generation gets adopted. So you can easily guess that as we start deploying 5G, we, and I mean here like researcher in telecom engineering, we have started already brainstorming and planning for what should 6G be. So we can say that it is essentially a speculative period of time and ha there has been more than a dozen perspective, vision, magazine style paper that have been published over the last uh, year or so, giving their vision on how beyond 5G or 6G networks should push the envelope and target higher speeds, uh, more user capacity uh, and lower uh, latency, let's say for a variety of emerging and future application that we are displaying here in the slide in front of you. So what we can say is that the 6G train, if you will, uh, the 6G train towards superior performance and, and better quality of service is actually already moving. But at this point, uh, let us look at some general concern as well as I would say even specific concerns related to uh, cellular network deployment. 
First, let us start by making some observations. Uh, obviously, the world is becoming far more urbanized and mega cities with population greater than 10 to 20 million people are emerging. Uh, so there is a greater need for large scale operation and management for cities to effectively serve its inhabitants. Let us also start looking at the other side of the coin of this so-called mobile revolution and discuss some concern related to power consumption. Indeed, according to a recently published white paper cited in the slide in front of you and reporting first measurement of 5G real-world deployment with all you know the, the new features of 5G such as uh, MIMO and uh, uh, or massive MIMO densification of 5G sites, the use of the millimeter wave band, the connection of millions of IoT devices. So this initial measurement, actually what they showed is, number one, that the power consumption of some bands of 5G equipment is up three times of 4G with the same configuration. And two, the number of sites is expected to be two to three times that of the 4G era in order to achieve 4G equivalent coverage. Of course, this is the case, especially in dense urban environment. So this significant increase in the number of base stations and their power consumption will not only accentuate the negative environmental impacts of cellular network fossil fuel consumption, but also bring some kind of financial pressure to uh, like major operators due to the expected increase in electricity goal cost or electricity bill for these mobile network operators. So we need, of course, to address this critical concern and develop modern green techniques in order to enhance uh, the energy efficiency of emerging and future wireless network to make them more cost effective and you know also decrease their negative environmental effect so uh, the objective of this kind of field of green networking is to aim at the minimization of the greenhouse gases emission and an obvious first step in this direction would be to enforce as much as possible the use of let's say renewable energy in the different ict sectors uh, and yet let's say that uh, 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 another natural track is to design low power component or let us say more uh, energy efficient device and system uh, but that are able to offer the same level of performance and quality of service from a data rate perspective. Uh, this will lead us down the road in, in this address to talk about uh, this concept of smart radio spaces as one potential interesting solution among others in this direction. This increase in power level leads to another concern related to electromagnetic fields, in short EMF exposure, and with it the concern of the general population about the potential health risks associated with the extra RF emissions from 5G base stations. There is obviously a lot of wrong information floating around including these uh, online claims linking 5G to the coronavirus uh, and which unfortunately led this past spring to arson attacks against cellular infrastructure in several countries like the UK, Ireland, Australia. So now, obviously, one has to worry about any possible health effects of radiation since uh, there is indeed this concern that EMF radiation may lead to all kind of you know, like skin illnesses, uh, brain cancer, uh, reduced fertility, etc., etc. So the good news is that so far, serious research studies from medical biofield as well as from radio engineering field perspective could not find any harmful link. Uh, as you know, the, the, the electromagnetic spectrum is broken into two categories, ionizing uh, and non-ionizing ionizing radiation which includes super high frequencies you know such uv x-ray and gamma rays are of course dangerous since uh, 
the energy from ionizing radiation can dismantle atoms and uh, and even let's say break the chemical bonds in, in DNA, which can damage cells and eventually lead to you know, some kind of cancers. But the, the microwave and millimeter wavelength radiation for 5G and let's say even the terahertz and uh, vi visible light wavelength radiation and vision for 6G fall uh, in this kind of uh, non-ionizing uh, radiation region and as such they generate a, a relatively small level of energies that uh, this kind of, with this level of energy you really cannot break atoms or harm cells. So uh, really the question that we pose in this survey paper that is listed here and that we uh, po uh, like we, we kind of archived uh, and that is going through the review process uh, now. So the question that we pose are uh, the following and, and they definitely need further studies and investigation. Uh, one uh, from a bio, let's say medical side is how the EM radiation, especially in the millimeter wave uh, and terahertz range, may affect human cells via other biological mechanism beyond this ionizing, non-ionizing mechanism. And uh, may, maybe there are some other biomechanisms that can eventually lead to cancers or any other dangerous neurological or cardiovascular diseases. So that's kind of the first uh, aspect that uh, one has to look at. And the, the second aspect, obviously, uh, this is our, for us, uh, telecom engineer, to expand research works from the device, architecture, network perspective, as well as the health and regulation perspective that aim to design, uh, let us say, radiation or uh, EMF aware cellular network for 5G and beyond system. Uh, and uh, I will talk a little bit about that down the road. Uh, let me now talk about the third concern by looking now at this map in front of you showing the current worldwide 4G distribution. It's clear that we are suffering from serious gaps in global internet connectivity, which is obviously another important concern. We tend indeed to forget that we still have about half of the world population or about 3 to 4 billion people without internet connectivity and it's expected that 5G at least in its current initial deployment stages will further accentuate this connectivity divide. Actually the COVID-19 pandemic showed also that the connectivity divide can be sometime a matter of life and death for people who are unable to access essential healthcare information and services and uh, is in a way becoming the modern face of inequality, uh, deepening the economic and social imbalances between the haves and have-nots. Thus, uh, in our view, 6G should be also about connecting the unconnected. Uh, and uh, there is a need for more intense research efforts to narrow this connectivity divide in order to offer uh, the often economically and socially isolated uh, and connected people uh, or interconnected people uh, to experience the transformative benefits uh, that come with connectivity from access to better health uh, and education services to smart farming, new opportunities, new jobs, uh, real town financial service and so on and so forth. So now that uh, we went through these three important concerns, it's good to uh, introduce or maybe remind you about uh, the so-called Sustainability Development Goals, in short SDGs. Uh, these are objectives that uh, have been adopted by the United Nations a few years ago and uh, they are essentially about kind of noble targets related to the environment, health, education, equality between people and gender, uh, eliminating poverty, uh, among many other uh, noble uh, objectives and targets. And uh, incidentally, they are supposed to be somehow achieved by 2030, which is the year when we expect the initial deployment of 6G. So with this in mind, uh, let us hope that in contrast to the previous generation of wireless communication network, 
uh, which were, let's face it, uh, essentially driven by financial and profit uh, perspective, let us hope that uh, the SDGs are going to drive, at least in part, the evolution of 6G, which means that 6G should keep, of course, uh, uh, let's say pushing the envelope by targeting improved efficiency in terms of bandwidth and power but also uh, can uh, target uh, uh, lower uh, bad effects on environment and human health uh, 6G should also be contributing to the development of tomorrow's digitally inclusive world so as part of our 6G efforts we should focus also on connecting rural areas, remote regions, and low-income slums. As we rely more and more in our uh, daily lives on wireless communication, an emphasis should be uh, also put on higher and more security uh, and uh, privacy. And of course, uh, again, because we be relying more and more on uh, networks, uh, we need to make sure that they are resilient, robust, and uh, you know essentially reliable as a wrap up of this part of the talk and looking at this uh, well-known 5g radar chart we can say that uh, an equivalent 6g radar or if you will spider chart will probably involve the same classical 5g users scenarios embb URLLC and MMTC but with tighter performance expectation or let us say stricter requirement. In addition we may see emerging and future application like for example in the augmented reality, virtual reality, gaming domains requiring the combination of the expectations or requirement of more than a single user scenario like for instance we may need to combine EMBB and URLLC type of expectation for AR, VR or gaming application I just mentioned uh, now. In addition uh, we believe that 6G should embody the so-called global access to the internet for all or in short the Gaia objective or in other words the fact that internet access must be considered as a basic human right. This can be done by adding an extra user scenario dedicated to a light version of the internet access which in the context of a superior 6G standard connection will be providing let us say an always on 4G like connection which will be suitable 10 years from now for basic online activities like emailing, web surfing and audio video streaming for every person. So we talked earlier about this concern regarding power consumption and the desire to go towards more green networks. One concept that emerged recently and that addresses this need is the so-called artificial radio space or smart radio space. Uh, in a way it can be viewed as a natural evolution of uh, communication theory. Uh, as you know, in the 40s of the past century uh, we developed uh, the match filter or in a way we kind of focus on optimizing uh, the communication system from the receiver side and then in the 90s of the past century we start uh, trying to optimize a transmitter with uh, adaptive modulation uh, adaptive uh, coded modulations uh, so uh, the natural kind of evolution of all this is to start actually optimizing uh, the channel itself the channel that uh, or the medium that connects the transmitter to the receiver with the artificial radio space uh, paradigm, the wireless propagation environment is turned into an intelligent reconfigurable space that plays an active role in transferring radio signals from the transmitter to the receiver. 
So this concept uh, is enabled by the use of intelligent reflecting surfaces, in short IRS, uh, in the environment. And these IRS are constituted of low cost, uh, low power consuming, you know, essentially passive reflecting elements that reflect the electromagnetic waves in desired ways and uh, let's say in a passive manner i mean without generating new radio signals and basically without incurring any additional power consumption is essentially you, 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 we can say that they're acting like a mirror and directing the signal towards not spots let me illustrate that in the following slides let us consider the situation where we have um, a mobile user uh, and a base station with a blockage in between or a poor channel quality but uh, let's assume that there is a nearby building that happens to have uh, a good uh, line of sight uh, condition with both the mobile and uh, the base station Therefore, we can take advantage of this configuration uh, to create, let us say, a virtual line of sight connecting the base station to the mobile user using uh, this uh, IRS. Going back to the EMF radiation concern I mentioned earlier, I would like to describe now one of the approach that we studied to reduce the EMF exposure uh, in order of course to minimize the potential health risk and in our approach we kind of propose a, a novel architecture for UAV assisted cellular uh, networks. With this brief uh, overview of tether drones uh, let me uh, tell you a little bit more about uh, our proposed novel architecture for tether drone assisted cell network uh, where these drones uh, carry small cells with what we call green, meaning by that receiver only antennas. Uh, indeed, it turns out that uh, uh, actually the harmful exposure is not really coming from a far away base station. By the time uh, uh, the signal coming from far away uh, downlink uh, uh, connection reach a mobile user, so basically it's very weak and it doesn't have uh, uh, any harmful effect. Most of the harmful effect may come from actually our own mobile or tablet operating uh, in an uplink kind of situation. So uh, the more far away the mobile uh, uh, unit is from the uh, base station, uh, the higher the power that it's going to utilize and the more uh, EMF exposure uh, or radiation it can uh, basically generate. As such, the idea is to decouple the uplink and downlink. This idea of decoupling, uplink and downlink has been used, of course, in different contexts. But here we are using it in the context of uh, EMF radiation reduction. And uh, uh, the idea is that uh, we'll still be receiving our downlink from the faraway base station, but all uplink will be going through this uh, receive only green tether UAV. And they are tether UAV because they will be kind of being placed in optimal location uh, depending on uh, traffic distribution in order to minimize as much as possible the transmit power from uh, uh, the mobile. So the problem is uh, about uh, selecting location of these tethered drones in a particular coverage area and then uh, associating uh, the users to particular uh, drones that are deployed in this uh, area and try to come up with an optimization problem where uh, the objective function is to reduce uh, the uh, exposure index given uh, a guaranteed quality of service. So we designed an adaptive uh, user uh, tether drone association scheme in order to minimize uh, the EMF exposure uh, accounting for uh, user inhomogeneous and time varying uh, spatial distribution uh, in the kind of uh, results uh, I'm showing in this slides the number of possible location uh, of the tether UAV is four times the number of tether UAV themselves and uh, we used uh, two optimization approach uh, one which is the, like the shrink and realign the other one is the k-means and uh, we showed that uh, with these two uh, kind of op 
approach, we are able to uh, reduce the EMF exposure with up to 30 and 5, 50% compared to random and worst uh, location of place green antennas, uh, where basically we are not using uh, tethered or at certain altitude, we are just using a kind of antenna on top of buildings. Uh, uh, and obviously, uh, if you don't use any uh, of these uh, green antenna and you just use uh, uh, the kind of standard base stage for both uplink and, uh, and downlink, the average exposure uh, is in this blue kind of uh, dash curve and it's much higher. Let us now uh, focus on uh, trying to address uh, the third concern I mentioned earlier, which is about uh, connecting uh, the so-called base of a pyramid. So the base of a pyramid uh, is not the word that I invented myself. It's kind of, uh, you know, was first introduced in this paper by famous economist. It's known as the base or bottom of a pyramid. And it's essentially the bottom of the wealth pyramid or the bottom of the income pyramid. Uh, and it's a kind of this largest, poorest socio-economic group. Um, and roughly it's between f three to four billion people that are actually the people that tend to be uh, uh, unconnected or underconnected. So as I mentioned earlier, currently, you know, about half of world population are unconnected or underconnected. They are mainly in rural, remote, low income and low literacy areas, and they are essentially lacking network infrastructure. So, you know, as I told you earlier, one can see that uh, the hope that in the future, broadband connectivity will be considered as a basic human or citizen uh, need or, or right. And uh, if we are able to provide connectivity to these uh, rural areas, uh, we should not only be uh, kind of uh, doing that from a humanitarian goal perspective, but because this is actually an opportunity to generate crucial economic activity in these areas. So, uh, you know, let's say small step towards connectivity at the base of the world economic pyramid can create uh, a huge market of creative and resilient consumer and producer who are essentially currently excluded from current uh, 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 formal markets. So like narrowing uh, this connectivity divide will eventually reduce the economic and social imbalance between uh, the have and have not in this digital context. Looking at this global connectivity map published by ITU, we see that the results are essentially not that great with uh, many countries suffering with serious uh, digital divide. Uh, the the reasons are many, I mean, besides the basic uh, social reason due to uh, lack of literacy or, uh, you know, limitation in the content, uh, essentially there are some strong economic and uh, technical reasons. So uh, the economic reasons are around the fact that the user equipment can be expensive uh, and they're getting more and more expensive with time. And uh, this area that uh, we are trying to cover uh, m might have uh, low population density, difficult terrain uh, and uh, non-existing infrastructure, uh, basically making them less attractive places to invest and operate a connectivity network. Uh, as you know, uh, the, 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 the mobile network operator operate on a, a return on investment kind of business model. So uh, it doesn't make much sense to um, lay hundred, if not thousand of kilometer of cable or fiber optics to reach uh, uh, a remote, uh, sparsely populated rural areas uh, essentially makes more sense obviously uh, to put um, uh, uh, this equipment in a uh, uh, highly dense area where you can get uh, maybe hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, dollars of revenue per month whereas uh, per kilometer square per month whereas uh, uh, you know uh, the revenues probably in some of these rural area will not exceed hundred dollars per kilometer square per month now on the top of that uh, we tend to forget that to have a reliable communication network, we need to also, of course, uh, use a, a power grid. And in many of these countries, the power grid is uh, either inexistent or in some areas, obviously. And uh, if it's there, it might be unreliable. 
going back to this noble uh, SDGs, uh, there is this hope that uh, as part of our 6G effort uh, and with the, let's say, cooperation of uh, partners like uh, internet service providers, network operators, developers, uh, local entrepreneurs, um, as well, of course, as uh, researchers in academia and industry, uh, and probably also subsidies of the government, we can explore new ways of bringing fast, uh, reliable internet to those without it. So, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, high quality connectivity enables uh, richer communication, uh, sharing knowledge, and uh, strengthening communities uh, uh, as well as their uh, economies by providing kind of health, education, uh, uh, benefits, as well as economical opportunities. We are, what we are advocating for is that with global connectivity and the expected uh, technological advances, uh, especially the one based on IoT, we can move out of this narrow uh, smart city concept to the broader concept of uh, let's say smart villages, smart towns, smart suburb, in short, smart living. Uh, one can enjoy quality healthcare, quality education, and several jobs uh, actually can tolerate employees working remotely with all the progress in communication technologies as we have, as we have seen over the last few months. So basically, uh, all this can take place in a less crowded, less polluted, not densely populated environment uh, and in a way, uh, quality living can be enjoyed without having to move uh, to a big city. And this may actually hopefully trigger the first global counter urbanization of the past, uh, let's say, 6,000 years. So uh, what did we wait? I mean, let's say, why did we wait so long to achieve this uh, so-called Gaia objective? To answer this question, let's look at the diagram displayed uh, uh, in front of you, uh, where you can see that traditional geostationary satellite communication system, uh, which are of course great for TV broadcasting, but offer limited bandwidth and suffer from a high latency as far as internet browsing is concerned. So they cannot deliver fiber quality for our purpose. This same diagram illustrates that full deployment of fiber cables or microwave wireless link is not economically feasible for remote areas which are typically characterized by a low density of population. So uh, our goal as part of our 6G effort is to go after uh, what I call the global connectivity holy grail on the top left of the diagram displayed in front of you. So I, I mean by that we are going for the best of both worlds and target a terrestrial fiber quality but with a global satellite coverage hopefully fulfilling the prophetic prediction made 100 years ago by nikola tesla and that you can read in this in this kind of slide displayed in front of you but the question is i mean how can we do that The answer is integrated space, air, ground networks. Indeed, global coverage without relying on the deployment of costly infrastructure on the ground will depend on the deployment of three-dimensional integrated network that include terrestrial, airborne, and satellite communication. As such, flying network platforms such as UAVs, flying cars, uh, tethered aerostat or blimp and high alpha platform could become ever present in the future. Now in this context uh, we are studying novel wireless communication schemes that integrate these three layers and that are aiming to support land, maritime and even flying user and devices. More specifically, what we are after is actually self-organized network that one, rely on terrestrial base station, drones, balloons, high altitude platform, uh, and non geostationary satellite. And two, these different layers adapt their structure and their resource allocation based on the ground population density 
and the quality of service requirement by the let's say application utilized by these population of users so obviously there are two kind of interesting research direction here there are effort on the backhaul aspect and there are effort on the access in conclusion uh, i would like uh, to thank you for your attention and conclude that uh, as telecom engineers we have no choice but to keep pushing the envelope uh, fulfilling this uh, other uh, interesting prediction made 100 years ago uh, by Nikola uh, Tesla. Uh, but uh, clearly, I hope that I convinced you that uh, we should do that. And actually, uh, I'm confident that uh, we can do it while uh, being more uh, inclusive and uh, in a green, uh, sustainable and uh, also health aware fashion. Uh, thank you again.